And this thing we really made head to toe. I mean, we made the bolo tie, we made the belt, we made the suit, we had it embroidered, we made the shirt. Um, the boots we didn't make, the boots we bought, but the boot tips we did make. And he <laughs> killed, you know, he killed it, yeah. literally. <laughs> he got killed to did. Um. Yes, he got killed. He, he got killed. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Art of Costume Podcast. I am Spencer Williams, and thank you so much for joining me for another extra special bonus episode. I am so excited to introduce you all to today's guest. Just saw such an amazing movie. I loved it so much, and I know you all are going to love it too. You would know her for her work on American Horror Story, Fast and the Furious Presents, Hobbs and Shaw, and a Netflix television show, Hollywood, for which she was nominated for an Emmy But today we're talking about their costumes for the new film directed by David Leach and starring just a huge ensemble cast, including Brad Pitt, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Joey King, Brian Tyree Henry, Haruyuki Sanada, and one of my favorites, Bad Bunny. I am talking about costume designer Sarah Evelyn. Sarah, welcome to the podcast. I've been so excited to talk to you. I saw Bullet Train the other day, and honestly, I loved every single second of it. And I was disappointed my final art interview was days away. I had to (laughs) wait all week. (laughs) So thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. (laughs) So Bullet Train is so fun. Uh, It's I believe it's based on a book. Lots of different costumes, uh, lots of different culture locations go from Tokyo to Kyoto. Uh, just first, when you started a bullet train, what were your, I guess, inspirations? How did you prepare for a project like this? I mean, I definitely started by there was I had a copy of the book that was transcribed into English. And I feel like that was a really big starting point for me. I definitely, definitely we started early with like a Japanese costume consultant and a Japanese cultural consultant, just looking at a lot of those things. Because, you know, while the film is very global, I felt like I still wanted to get the help kind of like beginning to understand sort of like where the book might have started. Right. So, so that, that was sort of like the beginning of thinking about bullet train The David and Kelly's team is really awesome and really collaborative. And I feel like this, and David comes, David and Kelly sort of come very directed. So I feel like next step was starting to really talk to like the production designer about the world that was being created and about the references that we were going to use and about the movies that we were looking at to think about this. Like I remember really being into Japanese noir films Mm -hmm. to even like sort of start considering this like Tokyo pop, for example, was really big influence. So kind of just getting down the visual language was important. And then as the casting started to come in, then I feel like you start to, so you have this sort of bigger picture that's like, what's our overall world? What's our overall aesthetic language? What are our touchstones that were sort of resonating between? And then as casting comes in, you can really start pinpointing things you know what i mean whether you're talking about color okay brad is in green all right everyone needs to be in something else is that (laughs) the kind of movie we're making or are we not making that movie so it's sort of like that it was like overall we formed the language of our film the visual language of our film and then as casting came in and we sort of drilled down on what people's characters were going to be it we kind of like found some grounding for it let's say Oh, that's fascinating. And I believe this took place during the pandemic, right? It was like one of the first movies, I think one of the first big movies that happened. And it was the kind of movie that doesn't traditionally happen in L.A. Like usually I feel like these movies are filmed somewhere else. So it was really amazing to be able to work in L.A. because L.A., is made for the movies. There are so many amazing artisans there. There are so many amazing resources there. There are so many talented, like super talented crew there. There, I had really, really incredible like costume supervisors and a really amazing, amazing crew. But 
it was crazy because like stores were closed or stores had decreased hours and there wasn't the same amount of stuff on the shelves and shipping wasn't coming as quickly and fabric stores were closed and supplied. There were supply chain issues. And not only that, it was when we were all working in the office with like glasses and masks and we would have to do fittings with a gown, a mask, and a full shield, which like is like Darth it is Vader so, style. Yes, it is so hard <laughs> to connect to another human like that. Yeah. So basically, like, you know, you're just like, hi, I'm Sarah, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> nice to meet you, sir. <laughs> That's so, crazy. So that was really crazy. And um, one thing we decided to do was really make a lot of the clothing. We knew we were going to need tons of multiples. We knew we were going to like we weren't going to be able to wait on supply chain or what was in the stores or the whole thing. So we made most of the costumes. Wow, that's impressive. Well, it all worked out. Um, (laughs) It all came out beautifully. And I'm really excited to just talk about all the different characters. Yeah. And we'll start with probably the coolest of them all, Brad Pitt, who plays Ladybug. I've never wanted a bucket hat so badly in my life. (laughs) It is so strong right now. I know, (laughs) the guy makes it look good. (laughs) Seriously, and the black rimmed glasses. Let's just dive into his look. You said that his color was green. Yeah. What was your concept behind the Ladybug? I mean, I would say this costume was incredibly collaborative. Brad definitely came with this idea that he would look like maybe he had been fishing at the docks. Maybe he would be wearing a bucket hat. And I was all about it. I feel like (laughs) it's a huge risk. And if anyone could pull it off, it was him. Right. And, you know, so we started trying on different silhouettes. Definitely, we're talking about workwear. Definitely, we're talking about things that might be a bit nautical, a bit fishing related, like the pea coat and the bucket hat. Started looking really hard at color and fabric and texture. And, you know, Brad is like an incredible filmmaker with like a wealth of knowledge that has a deep understanding, I feel, of like art and fabric that's a very visceral person. So he was really generous in sort of sharing all of his thoughts and ideas and willingness to like take these risks, which I feel like only makes the movie more awesome. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of risk. And I just, I, you could tell that it was very collaborative. You could tell that yeah. he had the most fun doing this film and so did everyone else on the film. Yeah. Yeah, totally. We took a long time person color with Brad. We were like between, we were between sort of like, a blue, a green, and a yellow, kind of trying to figure out what was going to look work best for the character in this very tight world of the train, you know? And we landed on the green, which I'm all about. I'm all about it. <laughs> Big fan. It came out wonderfully. Um, and then we have two characters who I love so dearly, um, Lemon and Tangerine. Yeah. Uh, their costumes are so fun. They're very sophisticated kind of blending in but they're also very dapper very i guess sophisticated for their line of work i would say (laughs) yeah yeah. i mean i think we sort of always knew tangerine was gonna wear a suit we had his casting like pretty early on and i think the idea was like he sort of wears a suit to contain the beast he would have grown up you know probably in like South London, and he would have always had his eye in Salvo Row, but he also would have been interested in gangster vibes, you know? Right. So that's sort of where we get this idea of both the pinstripes and the banker's collar, but also like the very, go- you know, the gold jewelry elements. Right. At the end of the day, he's a businessman and this is his mm-hmm. work. too. <laughs> yeah. Well, he would like to think so, but also I feel like at the very end of the day, he kind of like can't contain the beast, whether the beast, I mean, I I feel that this was a character with a ton of heart, you know, and he, he couldn't just be cold either way, actually, you know, like I think he fancied himself a businessman, but at the end of the day, I think he was like a lot of heart. Yeah. A lot of heart. I fell in love with these two characters. I was crying, then laughing, then crying again. And the lemon is wearing this denim looking jacket. And we yeah. talk a lot about Thomas the Tank Engine. I couldn't help but feel like this was kind of a conductor nod slightly, maybe yeah. a little. <laughs> I think that's right. You know, Lemon's casting came 
after Tangerine, after we already sort of knew what Tangerine was going to be wearing. And we wanted to play a little bit on the idea of twins, but also on the idea that they totally weren't twins. They were so (laughs) different. And so we liked the idea of kind of pairing the blue and pairing this suiting idea with like the top and bottom matching. But that's exactly right. For Lemon, it is more of a nod to Conductor. And, you know, he's wearing red suspenders. And also that's a bit of a nod to something more youthful, more playful, more workwear Conductor-like. Oh, I love that. It's so fun. Such a good character. But we have to talk about Bad Bunny. I am a yeah. huge Bad Bunny fan. I thought Benito did so good in this film. And his suit was incredible. I I audibly gasped when I saw him on screen. No, oh, I'm so glad. I am a huge <laughs> Bad Bunny fan too. Yeah. And like he just does not disappoint. I no. felt like it was a situation where he walked into this costume and he just brought it alive. I loved, uh, like, I really, really loved this whole sequence. And this thing we really made head to toe. I mean, we made the bolo tie, we made the belt, we made the suit, we had it embroidered, we made the shirt. Um, The boots we didn't make, the boots we bought, but the boot tips we did make. And he (laughs) killed, you know, he killed it, literally. (laughs) He got killed, it did. Um... Yes, he got killed. killed (laughs) (laughs) And I love just how the use of the color white you know he wore it because he was this was what he wore to his wedding but then also you see all the like costume distressing happening on his suit as well so it really stands out uh on the train yeah yeah. and i just watched before he got on i watched a video with the cast doing like a round table and they're talking about how bad bunny is dead essentially throughout the entire film but yet he's still there and he's kind of slumped over in a costume which i thought was pretty hilarious (laughs) (laughs) um okay we have joey king as the prince uh joey's character is (laughs) very mischievous but then when it comes down to it she pretends to be a cute little girl so her costume really has to help her in that tactic uh talk to me about the prince a little bit um, well, first of all, Joey is giving such good face in that picture. Like, <laughs> yeah. So amazing. She's like such a joy to work with. A great, great collaborator too. I, this whole cast was really fantastic and amazing. But for Joey, that's right. We were playing on kind of schoolgirl chic and sort of trying to play with like good and bad. You know, here you have a little pleated skirt that is both schoolgirl, school girl, but then become can become very like sexy with a really high heel and she's wearing like a high heel loafer which we also made but like but also very strong you know like this isn't just she's I I feel like what we were trying to do with this costume was play with feminine strength sexy not sexy power not power you know so it's like having the tie in a sort of strange salmon color with the collar tied all the way up. And it's a bit of a school goer uniform, but it's, there's also something like that's a bit of a power suit when you're just looking at this part. Right. So that's what we were really just trying to do with her. Yeah. It was very strong and it kept you kind of guessing literally until the last 15 minutes of the film, you don't understand this character fully until it's over. So the costume really lended to that. Yeah. One of my favorite people, I think, on this planet, Hiroyuki Sonata as the elder. Such a cool guy. I love him so much. His costume to me felt a little bit more uh, traditional in a sense. Like I knew who this character was the moment he stepped onto this train. Like everyone knew, like it's about to go down when you see the elder. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Hero is amazing. And he had such an amazing career. And actually, when David Leach was younger, I feel like, like he, I, I, he worked with Hero, like Hero was a bit of a mentor, I think. Um, and- other and they had had like a really long relationship and I was so excited to work with Hero and I felt like it was really a moment where we could try and integrate some garments that would be a nod to the more traditional and you know because because he's Hero and because he was in the movie and because he's an actor and because he's a Japanese we really really collaborated you know on these things including like we worked a lot on his coat which is sort of a bit of a nod to traditional Harari coat. 
And we worked a lot on his fabrics and wanted to make them like a bit speckly and a bit sort of heritage, but also kind of like gentlemanly. Yeah, that definitely came across. And you just, you could feel his presence. We see him in his costume, like he was a big deal, very serious, but also really cared about the situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we only see her for a quick bit, <laughs> but the Hornet played by Zazie Beats, uh, so good. She, mm-hmm. as we'll talk about in a little bit, is uh, hidden. She's disguised as one of the people on the train. So you mm-hmm. see her for a quick moment in... Well, her- she's in the Momadon. Yeah, right. that that too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, talk to me a little bit about her look. But then as we get into it, we're going to also talk about just creating the train in general and the people on the train. Yeah. Well, Zazi, so we had already sort of developed this, what the uniform was going to be by the time Zazi was cast. So we sort of knew what this would look like on her. And we, you know, we essentially like we took the train logo and we spread it out across the top of the uniform. And that's kind of what like makes the striping across the top of the chest. And I love these hats. These hats are like what Japanese train conductors wear, but Fitting her in the Momodot was super duper duper fun, actually. She had like a really fun time walking around in that in our fitting and definitely made everybody laugh. It was sort of, that was kind of like the reveal of the actual Momodon to the cast and crew, you know? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. I didn't realize she was actually in the Momodon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's a point where she takes the head off and it's like her. Right. You know. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was so in love with the movie. I, I probably missed yeah. that detail, but that's amazing. So then <laughs> there let's, was a lot happening. Yeah, there's a lot happening. Uh let's talk about the Momodon then, actually. Was this your first time doing a costume like this? Because I know it's such a crazy process creating something like this. It is. Well, this was actually designed by the production di- designer David Shinneman. Okay. This was like his genius idea and his genius idea for like a whole Momodon car and how having some sort of like Japanese mascot. I felt like it actually really helped create our world and kind of like rounded it out. Um, We did end up making it because my costume supervisor, Jim Tyson is a legend when it comes to building and knows a lot about building things like this. I mean, he knows a lot about building everything, but he ended up making it at a shop called Thingery. And yeah, it does take a lot to make. And then it takes it even more to make in a way that it can be used practically. You know, you have to think about because the Momodon did stunts. So you have to think about (laughs) how your stunt guy gets in there, how your stunt guy sees, how your stunt guy breathes, how he doesn't die of heat, you know? Right. So it was the concept was done by David Shinneman and the build was really done by Jim Tyson. And they're both super brilliant. I feel lucky I get to work with them. I love it. And I agree with you. It really just kind of rounded everything together. Yeah. It really brought you into the world. You were laughing, but then you're also a little scared of it at the same time. Yeah. You don't know how to feel. <laughs> I love the part when it's like they're fighting over the briefcase, you know? <laughs> yes. It's hilarious. So good. And I feel like I yeah. need like a stuffed animal in my house now or something. Definitely. So taking a break from the main characters for a little bit, as we talked about this a little, uh, there's a lot of people on this train at first. It slowly starts to get less and less, but there's a lot of background actors, uh, specifically yeah. the the people with the carts. And then the, the one lady who keeps shushing a lemon and tangerine, which I don't understand why they are not getting it quiet. <laughs> um, so what was it like designing for all these uh, background characters? It was awesome. And actually a lot of the characters, I mean, a lot of the background came back day after day after day because they would have been on the same, you know, like we were filming these same cars day after day after day. Right. So that was kind of cool, especially during COVID when it was like such a weird time and it was sort of a joy to get to see people on a regular basis, let's say, and feel like you were a bit of a community. It's a little bit more of a commitment than usually you would see on a film like this. Definitely. Definitely. And I love Jushing Passenger. She was hilarious. <laughs> so good. Such. I mean, I I felt her a little bit. You yeah. Know. <laughs> I wish we got to see more of her sweater. I feel like there was a duck on it, but whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I get that. I could see it when I was sitting in the theater. It's really <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then uh, of wrapping up with the White Death, but not just the White Death, but his crew also. Very... Yeah. Uh, like took you out of the train and suddenly you're scared. These yeah. people are serious. 
their masks were beautiful at the same time as just really shrouding them in mystery and fear. Uh, so talk to me about the White Death and his crew. Yeah, well, those the white well, obviously the white death had to be this like major major character and i i would say that it's one of those situations where you know the costume doesn't make the character it's like the actor can wear the costume and make the character and michael shannon like definitely did an amazing job we wanted a guy that looked like he'd been you know very wealthy and then maybe hadn't changed since his wife died so we came up with this idea of this sort of old school smoking jacket, like a bit Mm. of a retro vibe. And David, you know, it was really these masks really were David Leach's concept and sort of a way to create this mystery and this real, you know, fear. And the the masks were also built at Thingery, which is the same place that Milt built the moment on. Right. And like his his character to me, like I felt like I recognized this character a little bit. It You could tell he was a villain, but a little bit more complicated yeah. than you would think. Um, yeah. Like an anime character or something. I don't know. He was very cool. Totally. Um, yeah. Like you could tell there like it felt like there was backstory. Right. To him. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, that actually kind of brings us to the end. You know, this isn't a podcast, but usually when we do, we like to do a little game called One Costume to Rule Them All. The one costume to rule them all. Do you have a one costume to rule them all from this film that you just like see it and like, I love that one. Maybe it's not your favorite. I won't make you pick a favorite. Right, right. No, I can't (laughs) pick a favorite. I cannot pick a favorite. Oh. Was there one you saw on screen where you're like, wow, that really came together? Um, oh, they're all my babies. Hold on. Let me think for one second. <laughs> you can say <laughs> they no. They really too. are okay. all my babies. I could imagine because it's different because, you know, they all wear the same costume. So it's not like they have changes. No, it's true. And that makes like the costume so much harder, actually, because it's like this one costume has to say everything. Yeah. Can't I just say I love all my children the same? That works. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would Thank be you. the wolf costume. That's my yeah. one costume to rule them all. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Sarah. Um, like I said, I was very excited to speak with you. This film is great. Thank you all so much for listening. And thanks again to costume designer Sarah Evelyn for joining me. Be sure to go see Bullet Train as soon as possible. It's so good. I love this movie and I want to see it again and again. And I know you all will love it. Yes, everyone go see it. (laughs) Stop what you're doing. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted and produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Our audio engineering and editing is done by Dan White. Follow us on Instagram at the Art of Costume Pod or visit the Art of Costume Blogcast.com for all blogcast updates. If you want to support the show, go to the Art of Costume.com slash pod store. Or you can head over to patreon.com slash the art of costume for some bonus content. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, head over to the art of costume.com, a blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. I forgot what it was called. Let me show you. Because it's in theaters, I only have so many pictures. But yeah. what what okay. was the name oh, of the Momadon. mascot? It's Momadon. Momadon? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to just write that down. Yeah. Momodon. Momo. 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 <laughs> Great. <laughs>